We had a lunch mm -hmm. um, that uh, we were talking about. I think maybe uh, maybe it was Marty had been arrested for <laughs> driving too fast, and I think he was known for that a little bit, wasn't he? Yeah. Anyway, he um, he was arrested, and uh, I was, you know. I've never, I've, ne I've never been stopped by the police for my driving. Next day, <laughs> actually, I think it might have even been on the way home. Oh, it was bad. Mm -hmm. Were you destined to be a lawyer? No, no. I started out as a nurse. I graduated from the University of Rochester with a RN and a Bachelor of Science degree, and I taught nurses. That's what I did while Clark was um, in uh, vet school. So no, I was not. What did what your mom and dad do? My my mom, I think she didn't she didn't work much. She worked during the war at Hudai, which was a munitions or some kind of a war mm -hmm. plant. And my dad was a. Uh, he had his own business after the war. He worked at Bell Aeronautics during the war, working on the landing gear for the planes that were to land on the aircraft carriers. But my dad um, had a business with my grandfather. They sold garage doors and other building type products. So he was, they were successful. And um, where was hometown? Buffalo, Buffalo, Amherst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your dad worked in the Buffalo uh, Aeronautic Plant during the war. war. Mm -hmm. uh, did he talk much about that? Was that that experience at all? Mm -mm. Not at all. Yeah. No. No. He. Um, I only know since I've been doing uh, uh, genealogy, I've been looking into both. You know, both of our backgrounds and. Um, my dad quit college. He was at uh, Michigan State mm -hmm. and he quit and went into the Navy. And then he went to uh, Great Lakes where he got his initial training. And he was trained as a radio operator. And then they sent him to California. And then, for some reason I don't understand, sent him back to Bell to work on the landing gear. Mm -hmm. So that's where he ended up is most of the war. Is he an engineer type guy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he wanted to be. So you're in Buffalo. How did you meet a guy like Clark? Um, we grew up to it together, going oh. to the same school. Oh, one of those high school sweethearts? <laughs> yeah. I saw it. I met him on the school bus. <laughs> oh, so this is long standing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, mm -hmm. not going to get any stories out of here. <laughs> Uh -huh. So you're, you're in nursing school, and at some point you have an aha moment saying, maybe I ought to do something different. Yes. Well, when my kids were starting to get school age, I mean, it's, two of them were in school and one of them was about four, I started thinking about going back to work. And I went to our local hospital, and there were... Um, local being... Westfield, Westfield uh, Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they weren't really catering to nurses. <laughs> you had to work split shifts. You had to work a share of nights, a share of days, a share of um, mornings. You had to work uh, some holidays, some weekends. It was just, you took your share of everything. And Clark was working every other weekend, every other holiday, every other night. And I just didn't think that was going to work out for our family very well. So I started to think, well, what could I do where I can control my schedule? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it came to me, well, I could go back to law school. And that's where the thought started. And then everybody was discouraging me. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just take the LSAT, and if I do okay on it, then I'll consider, you know, going on from there. So I took that, and I did well, and then I applied to the University of Buffalo, and I got in, and 
I only really had the one choice, um, the University of Buffalo. Um, so I drove back and forth to Buffalo for three years and finished. What year did you graduate? 1984. I started in the four-year program, but after the first semester, I just moved up because it wasn't, you know, I, I didn't need the extra time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you go to law school, you are never finished reading everything that they want you to read. Um, so I just read what I could and, you know, took care of my kids and did the things I wanted to do. and still graduated so do you remember a professor or two at UB that was kind of a, a role model saying gee this guy's good yeah the person is good um, my um, secured transactions and she had to she was a she and I can't remember her name but she was really good she was real sharp and I liked her a lot um, I liked my um, contracts in the first year. He was just a hilarious, um, can't remember his name either. Um, and then my torts teacher, he was funny, he was actually the dean at the time, mm -hmm. and he had cocked up this new, cooked up this new basis for torts, which was car accidents. Mm -hmm. So that's what, how we learned torts was through car accidents. And that's how Matar, when you hear it on TV, you know, in a car accident, you know. <laughs> William Matar, hurt in a car? Yeah. Call William Matar, 888-8888. It probably all started there. Mm -hmm. um, so then you graduate. Yes. Uh, and you, obviously, hometown is Westfield. And the reason it's in Westfield, that, is that where Clark got his first job? That's where Clark, well, it wasn't his first job. It was his third job. First, we went to New Hampshire and just loved it there. It was just beautiful, um, but the schools were terrible and we wanted our kids to go to college, so we would have had to send them away to boarding school. That didn't appeal, so um, we decided that, well, and also Clark's dad was having a hard time. His mom had died. and. He was just having a real hard time, so we moved back then to Middleport, and Clark worked there. He was a large animal, mm -hmm. mostly a large animal at the time. Mo moved back to Middleport and then moved to Westfield. And he was still large animal and small animal, um, but he, um, 1984, I think, he, they went to just small animals, because Everything was turning into grape farms. Yep. And we had to go farther and farther. So, yeah. No, existing practice, or did he start a practice? No, he started in a in Westfield. He started with Don Eno, mm -hmm. and um, there was two before him. So the the practice was actually established in forty five. Nineteen forty five. Oh, standing practice. Yeah. Same location. Same location. Then you come back, obviously, having graduated from uh, uh, University mm -hmm. of Buffalo Law School. And what was your sense about practicing? Were you thinking about hanging up your own shingle? And yeah, um, I I found a mentor in the, um, Roger Hammer, who was a lawyer in Westfield, thinking about retiring, starting to retire, and his idea was. He had extra room in his offices, so he just let me use it. And um, I didn't have any secretary at first. I remember typing my wills on a regular typewriter, and you know how often you make a mistake <laughs> and start all over again. Um, so yeah, but he, he was really good. He, he went with me on my, one of my first calls, which was two men in Brockton, toe to toe, going to kill each other over a cement pad mm. in one of them's garage that the other one was accused of cracking. And uh, so he went with me and, uh, and we kind of 
settled that little situation before there was any death. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he introduced me to other attorneys and to Judge Adams, um, who uh, I told you about when I went in to meet him and he said, oh, isn't she cute? Can we keep her? <laughs> so that was, yeah. And that was the way, way it was at the time. You know? So Roger, so you just shared office experience and Roger was sort of the senior mentor to you. Yes. What kind of practice did he have? He was mostly estates. Okay. Uh, state planning, estate administration. And, um, and that's where I kind of fell into that um, as being my major. I remember Michael Dunleavy. Okay. Do you remember sure. him? He was in uh, Northeast and he was planning to also, um, you know, ally with, um, with Roger Hammer because uh, he was in Northeast and he wanted to come into the Westfield area. And um, he was bent on the fact that I had to have some experience in criminal law. And I had no intention of doing any criminal law. But anyway, he, on his own, gets me assigned as attorney of record for this guy in the prison at Westfield. <laughs> Told me he would go with me and be with me the whole way. Well, he didn't ever turn up. <laughs> and I'm in the jail with this huge, scary guy with black power cut into his arm and scars. And I'm supposed to represent him. I know nothing about criminal law. <laughs> this guy immediately looked at me and knew I knew nothing about criminal law. But that was my experience in criminal law. Mm. And Michael, I've held a grudge against him ever since. <laughs> Did you get to see it to the end? Yes, but it didn't ever it didn't ever amount to anything because the policeman never turned up uh. that had arrested him. So, um, you know, and that was another thing. I had no idea of the underside of Westfield life. <laughs> I didn't know there was mm -hmm. anything criminal that happened in Westfield. So that was an eye opener too. So you probably got this guy off and that means you're probably... <laughs> oh yeah, that made my, my reputation. So, you know, the next one was a, was a, a, uh, what do you, DWI, DWI, he called me in the middle of the night. He was actually Gibbs Kern's client mm -hmm. and he um, had been arrested in the middle of the night and I was called out because they couldn't get a hold of Gibbs and I knew nothing about that either. And, uh, but the guy's wife, she was worse than anything that the legal system could have. <laughs> could have dealt him, but we ended up just kind of taking him back to Ripley where he was arrested. And uh, he was arraigned there. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word? He was arraigned in Ripley. The judge, we had to wait half the night for the judge to turn up, but, and he, then we took him home to make sure that he didn't, didn't drive under the influence. And uh, that was the end of that. <laughs> I can remember those days myself. <laughs> uh, you get called and you got to go. I mean, yeah. You get, oh, yeah. yeah. The police are expecting you. Exactly. And somehow you're now the attorney because mm -hmm. you answered the phone. Mm. Yep. And I remember my first um, divorce. No, my first, well, yeah, it was sort of a divorce. Anyway, the lady <laughs> was really, really old. And her husband, her, this is her second husband. And she was his second wife. I mean, they had to be in their 80s. And he had hit her on the head with a hammer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she happened to be the police chief's aunt. So he called me. And I'm supposed to do something about this. And uh, anyway, it was, it was just awful the whole way through. Um, Jim Westman was on the other side, mm -hmm. and you know I tried to to get him to talk about it, you know, and get the families together. 
um, to work it out because they couldn't live together. You know, this was obviously <laughs> not a good thing. Um, but no, he wanted her property, and she was, when they when they married, she had significantly more property than he did. And so, um, you know, they wanted that property. So anyway, that was just a, a horrible thing. Um, so we turn up in court for the trial, and uh, Jim Westman comes, and he's got two legal paralegals with him and him and my client is a little old lady and I'm with her and she looks at them and she thinks that there's three against one and she wants to settle so we settled yeah. I mean I never got to have a trial so that was that was your chance that was my one chance that was my dem that was my family law <laughs> sure. experience did you uh, find yourself in front of Judge Adams at all uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. What was his? What was the experience like? Aside from that initial conference with you and Roger, uh, what was what was your experience of Judge Adams? He was a character. I would just remember being in in his office, you know, for like a conference, a pretrial conference or something, and he was throwing cards into a waste paper basket, all the while we were talking, and uh, he he was just a character. Yeah, yeah. we took him. Um, later on, Jim Summer and I took him to uh, some of the meetings, some of the bar, the Northern Chautauqua bar meetings at that fireside, and we picked him up. He lived in a, in a huge old Victorian house. Um, yeah, he was something. <laughs> so you, as far as your career, you're now sharing offices with Roger Hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, I assume Roger retired? Yes, yes. Um, I, I had worked up to where I had an actually computer <laughs> and I had a secretary mm -hmm. while, while he was still there. Mm -hmm. And um, things he didn't want to do, he would give me. And every once in a while, he would give me one of his uh, estates to work on. And so I did a lot of the basics of the estate work that, for him. And um, that's how I, you know, got to be uh, knowledgeable about that. That was the area where I was most knowledgeable of anything. And uh, yeah, he did want to. He started to go down south for the summer, mm -hmm. and he liked to go to Portugal. Huh. That was he and his wife would go to Portugal, um, and so he was gone a lot. Um, and um, then he did retire, yeah. And we worked out something where if he, if I, if the people who had made a will with him came to do an estate, then I would give him a portion of the executor's commission, or the attorney's fee, I should say, yeah. yes. And. Was there anybody else with you? I keep thinking that there was a... Uh, you, you yes. Um, later on, um, I joined with uh, Stephen Zangi and Gibbs Kern. Okay. And that worked out well as far as Stephen, but not so well with Gibbs. Um, he did have... What he had in mind was we would be together, but he would practice separately. So it didn't work out well at all. He had his own secretary and um, and he just smoked terribly. Um, and Stephen's office was upstairs. I bought a house to have our office in and um, Stephen couldn't tolerate the smoke up there. Um, that's where they were both. They had their offices upstairs and I had mine downstairs. And finally we had to ask Gib, Gibbs to separate, which was, I mean, he still stayed there and it was the same basically because he was working on his own anyway. Um, what kind of practice did he have? 
Mostly DWIs. Yeah. Mostly DWIs, yeah, in Westfield. And um, uh, he didn't do much real estate. Stephen did lots of real estate. And Stephen was a very good lawyer. Um, he, uh, he could take anything and he would research it and he, he wasn't afraid to take it all the way. I mean, he had, uh, I don't know if you were familiar, but there was a man, I believe his name was Morrison or Morris, and he was a lawyer. He was working for Chautauqua Energy, or he was Chautauqua Energy. And um, he didn't like the sign on the church across the street. Mm. He thought it was too big. And his house was across the street from it. And he sued the church. And then Stephen represented the church. And he went all the way to the Court of Appeals. Mm. And um, he wasn't afraid of that. I mean, I would have been afraid. I would have had to, to ally myself with somebody who was more knowledgeable about that. But he wasn't afraid of any of those things. And he won, you know. So, um, I, I, he was, a, I will, admired him. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned names in the Westfield legal community. Gibbs Kearns, I remember him as a train aficionado. Oh, yeah. Yes, he would sit down there watching the trains go by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't he own the station at one point or had something to do with the, the actual Westfield station? I don't know. I, I don't think he owned it, but um, he might have. And the he, reason I know that could is have. my client, Dr. Randall Swanson, bought it. Mm -hmm. And Gibbs was always around. I'm trying to think whether he got bought it from him or he was just, he was just there. Mm -hmm. uh, he the just, with the hat and... He just wanted to um, make sure that, like, the interior wasn't changed and yeah. that the, you know, those bars that they had for the people who were selling tickets, that they would stay because some of that stuff was still there. So I think that's probably where he was. He, he, I don't know if he had enough money to buy it. I don't know. Uh, maybe he was just a consultant or the historical society. Or yes. Whatever. I'm not exactly sure, but yes. he was a presence. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then you mentioned Steve, of course. And, yes. And um, what other attorneys were sort of in that Westfield scene? Well, I mentioned Tony Rizzo once to mm -hmm. you. Um, he was a character. Um, he was another older man like, like um, Roger, and I believe that he worked to the day he died. Mm. Um, he just, he had his clients, um, he was like an old Italian man, and he had, there's a lot of Italian people in Westfield, and they would go to him, that would be their favorite, and uh, so he had um, a good clientele. Was he by himself? He was always by himself, yeah. yeah. He had a secretary who would protect people, women, who went in, <laughs> because he was one that would chase you around the desk. Um, so he had a bad reputation that way. Um, and then there was Bart Shack in Westfield. He didn't move to, to Mayville till after, a bit later. And um, um, Beckman. Jack. Jack Beckman, but there was, um, there was a group at Brant and Lachlan um, I can't remember the first name of the... Lachlan. Bob Lachlan. Bob Lachlan. Bob Lachlan. Brandt. Yes, yeah. yes. I never knew Mr. Brandt. He, um, but I did know Bob Lachlan because he would work there. And um, he, he wanted, when I first graduated, he interviewed me. He wanted me to come and work for them and I was afraid of him. <laughs> he was just not, I don't know, warm. Um, My impression also. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and kind of highfalutin kind of person. And so um, there was also another guy that worked there who was a really nice Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember his name either, but 
he worked there at the same time. Jerry Hyde? Jerry it, Was it Hyde? But it was a Jerry It Hyde. might have been Jerry Hyde. And his wife. Uh, H his nice wife? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was him. Um, and also then eventually they had the woman, um, she became, uh, she became something in politics. Mm. She started there. Um, Grace. Grace Hanlon? Hanlon. Okay. Yeah, she started there. I did not know that. Yeah. But that was after me. That was after I was established. So it seemed to me, uh, uh, Brant McLaughlin, McLaughlin Brant, uh, but they had an office in Westfield, an office in Dunkirk, and that's ultimately an office in Mayville. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And guys in Dunkirk were guys like Peter Clark and Dick Whipple. Mm hmm. Then, they were in Fredonia. They were Fredonia. Sorry, Fredonia. Fredonia. Mm -hmm. Fredonia. Uh, and so it was, it, there was Whipple, Clark. I never knew Don Brandt, but and then McLaughlin was in. Westfield. He was in Westfield. Yeah. Yes. And then Bob, as I recall, then became county attorney for a yes. period of time. Yes. Yes. And that's really my past cross. Isn't yes. It? Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, Sherry Cadwell once told me he was not in the front row when humility was passed on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was a that was a good characteristic. Yes. I just I just got the impression that I would be the girl. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to be the girl. <laughs> and it's you know, they talk about the harassment a lot. Um, and you know, I told you about what Judge uh, Adams said, and that would be taken terribly today, mm -hmm. but it just was part of the deal. There weren't that many women, and you know, you, we would sit in the family court or in the surrogate's court office waiting our turn, all of us together, and it, they were the boys club, you know, and they would say things that were kind of off color and um, not to you, you know, but telling, talking about their weekends and what they were doing and so forth and so on. And I can remember Jane Love and I sitting in the family court and saying that, well, it was just a, it was, we would look at each other and we'd just say, it's a symptom of testosterone poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, it, we just let it roll off, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. It, it's just kind of what you expected. Um, but now, yeah. they would not be able to do any of that kind of stuff. And people would have, um, you know, would have called them on it. But, you know, to me, to Jane, yeah. to all of us, I'm sure to Cindy too, it was just, eh, yeah. it's part of the deal. <laughs> So you are now worked your way with a uh, relationship with Zangi and Gibbs Kearns, and, uh, and at some point enters Phillips Lytle and yes. Jim Summer. I kind of forget the complete story. How did that happen? Well, it happened through Francine Pearsall. Pearsall. She was doing our taxes, and she came to me and she said, you know, this arrangement that you have is really disadvantageous to you. You're carrying these people, and um, at the same time, she said, and I think I want to mention you to Branton Auckland, or to um, Phillips Lytle. And I said, well, that would be fine, you know. And that's how it happened. It's through Francine, Francine Pearsall. She knew Jim Summer, and um, she must have mentioned that, you know, I did mostly estate work, and I guess that's what Phillips Lytle wanted at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went, you came to my house and talked to me, and that's how it started. Nancy was grossing more than the, the two men she was practicing yeah. together. She yeah. was, had more, more output than the two yeah. men. I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Did, uh, I mean, I remember going down and visiting you, and I uh, remember with, with Jim and how impressed, of course, we were. 
and it did fit a complete need. Jim was winding down. Mm -hmm. and, yes. Uh, at the time, and I don't think he wanted to be out of it, no. but he didn't want to do all the all Correct. the stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was um, sort of myself. I was traveling back and forth from Jamestown to, to Fredonia, and uh, a lot of real estate, a lot of estates, because they had a, they have a book of business. Mm -hmm. And with with Jim sort of winding down, and I know uh, Caroline Burke. Mm -hmm. uh, was coming down, but we knew that she was coming from Buffalo, and it just made sense that the two of you would become best friends, and uh, mm -hmm. and then you came up, and so you did you you worked out of uh, the Fredonia office, right? Yes, yeah, I worked came. in the Fredonia office, and then eventually I spent a day in Jamestown right. as well. So, yeah, um, it was really nice. I had a wonderful time with Philip Slidell. It was just. I liked all the people, and um, I wasn't being taken advantage of. <laughs> no more trips to jail. Uh, what did you say? No more trips to jail. Nobody, nobody assigned me to criminals or anything like that. I could just do what I really liked. And you know what else was nice is um, Medicaid planning was very, mm -hmm. very intricate and took a lot of time and yet the people didn't have any money you know so it wasn't a big money maker uh, for the firm but i was told i could go ahead and do it for for clients you know right. for clients of the of the firm and that made me feel good and i just had a nice time <laughs> how long were you with us about five years i'd say mm-hmm we still have a number of your wills here. I mean, they, they, they keep coming in. Nancy Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And so you were there, and then uh, this sort of retired, didn't you, from, from there? Yes, I started to have problems with my eyes. That was the first that I knew that I had this um, condition. And I started to have problems where I wasn't being able to see very well. Mm -hmm. And you really have to spend a lot of time reading. Um, so. That's where I first was having trouble, um, lots of headaches, and um, so I thought, well, this is, I'm, I better do this before I make a mistake, you know, do something in error. And was Jim still there the whole time? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tell me about Jim Summer. Oh, Jim Summer was a wonderful gentleman. He was just... I don't know, you just admire him. Every time I think of him, I feel warm. <laughs> he, he would hold your coat and put your coat on for you, help you hang it up, stood up at the table when a woman came or left. Um, he was just, there was never anything untoward about him. Um, he, there was no even gray about him. He was totally white. <laughs> um, he took the cribbing well because one time at the Christmas party Peter Clark was a, he was really funny and he was the master of ceremonies and he was picking on Jim. He always picked on Philip Slidell a lot <laughs> but he was picking on Jim and he was saying I, he wondered if he wore a pinstripe three-piece set of pajamas at night because he was always dressed in his suit mm -hmm. and his or a sport coat and a tie and he just oh, I really I would say I loved him yeah. you know he was a good man well I incredibly respected and admired and I mm -hmm. can remember the same Chris yes we did get Phil Slottle took a lot of uh, <laughs> abuse. Abuse. And I was the guy. Uh -huh. I was the face. Yeah. And it was it was all in good humor, but Peter could dish it as well. Oh, as yeah. Yeah. And uh, but he called. I remember one night he called from the fireside during it to the <laughs> office, the Phil Philip Slottle office, and you know it was like eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and Jim was there. Yeah. Jim was there. He goes. There we go. That's our Jim Summer. He's there working on some title search. Yep. Something wow. like that. Yep. Yep. I remember one time he was doing, we were doing a real estate 
deal, and this was before I was working at Phillips Lytle, and he called me up and he said his person was the buyer, my person was the seller, and he called me up to tell me that the lady didn't want to buy the house anymore that he was representing because there were snakes in the basement and they were eating the eyes out of the mice that were in the basement. Hmm. And would we just be willing to cancel the contract? And I said, well, I'm sorry, but no. <laughs> he said, I didn't think so. <laughs> but he said, I had to ask. <laughs> My client wanted me to ask. <laughs> so, yeah. So you, you crushed them. You mm -hmm. crushed them. Nice, nice. Yeah. And I remember um, Caroline Burke as well. Mm -hmm. She Is she still mm -hmm. around? Still, still among us. And is she I, still working at Phillips Lytle? No. Oh. She comes in occasionally and, and you know, is the witness will, just like yeah. you, know, you do. Um, yeah, no, she, she seems to be fine. She's an, she was a wonderful person, too. And Tim was there? Tim Eads? Tim. Tim Eads was there. Um, and he was Tim, um, just a very nice guy. Uh, he had a very loyal following as well um, in Fredonia. People that knew him because he grew up there, and mm -hmm. um, and so he he had a lot of real estate work, and uh, yeah, but he wouldn't let anybody help him. I don't think much has changed. No. Uh, but you, the three of you, which were the three resident lawyers of Phillips Lytle and Fredonia, had something in common. Yes. We all had the same birth date. And there was somebody at the office in Buffalo who figured out the probability of it, and it was like in the infinitesimal probability that that would happen. It was, it was really neat. <laughs> I remember it was a birthday party, and uh. Paul... I think it was Paul Zydock, man, he was the managing mm -hmm. partner, came yes. down to the luncheon, mm -hmm. and there was Jim and you and Tim, and he got up and spoke about that. Yep, yep. Uh, and that was also the time where we had the surprise guest of uh, Charlie Calasano. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I didn't know him very well. I just know of him, and I did meet him uh, several times, but he had a wonderful reputation, too, as a, as a good gentleman. And uh, if there was a guy who loved to have a stump speech, you know, you put him in a rotary and he might have been a member and you'd say, does anybody want to get up and give a 20 minute talk? <laughs> well, that would have been Charlie Calasano. <laughs> the different personalities, and that was the beauty of it all, the two of them were mm -hmm. beautiful matches, but they were different personalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, are, retired? Are, are you doing any law now? Are you, are you a monk no. around? Did you give no. up your license? Yes. Well, no, I still have it, but I don't do anything yeah. other than, you know, free advice. <laughs> People are always calling me to <laughs> ask me for free advice, mostly about divorces, which I know nothing about. But <laughs> So, having done a variety of things, as a, so, as a practitioner in Chautauqua County, you get asked to do family court matters, you ask to do survey court matters, some law guardianships when you don't want to, but there you are. Was there, was there a humorous story or unusual story or two that you <laughs> dare share? Yeah. In family court, um, I'm <laughs> representing this, this guy. Actually, I wasn't representing the guy, but he was part of my, I was representing the children. And he was being, being claimed to be the father of these children. And, you know, there was uh, testing, DNA testing, paternity testing going on, and we were at family court. And there he stands up. Here we are, all standing before the judge. And what does he have on but a sweatshirt that says stud muffin? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> That's not helping your case. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh, that was funny. That was funny. Yes, yes. And that was before Judge Claire or Judge Hartley? That was before Judge Hartley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Early on. Yeah. <laughs> I was a family, uh, I was a law guardian for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had some difficult cases because I was a law guardian for a long time and I did, 
I'm going to say that for myself, I did try to do a decent job of it. And he would send me these really hard ones. I had to go to a Freedom Village one time and get a little girl out of there. <laughs> mm. And so mostly I'm thinking of when you say, what funny things, they're mostly sad things, you know. Little girls who try to say, oh, my mother's boyfriend is uh, assaulting me, but my mother won't believe me, you know. Those are the kinds of things yeah. I think of, you know. That's not so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a, no, that's not a funny thing either. <laughs> unusual, perhaps. Uh, you you would you got a chance to meet several attorneys during that time period in the, in the North County specifically. Um, any particular characters you remember? Was it a whether it's a Ricotta? A, <laughs> just drop a few names. A Tony Spann or mm. anybody like that. Who was the characters? Well, I mentioned Tony Rizzo. He was a character. Yeah. Um, Jack's reputation, and it's not so much a character, but perhaps, what did he do, Jack Beckman? I always get the envision he was an oil and gas kind of thing. He, he, got he was an oil and gas kind of thing. He did a lot of real estate. Yeah. Peter see. Clark? Oh, Peter Clark. He was funny. I always liked Peter Clark. Dick Whipple, he was just kind of shy, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, came across him, and then, of course, I mentioned... Mr. Laughlin, yeah. and... Did you pass cross with Bill Foley? Or? Oh yes, Bill Foley I really, really liked mm -hmm. a lot. He was very, a very good lawyer, I think, too. Yeah. Um, very responsible and, uh, you know, if he said he was going to do something, he did it. Right. Give and me your he, best, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hmm. Give me your best Charlie Laughlin story. Charlie Laughlin. <laughs> <Lovelin. laughs> I forgot Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, he would, he came into the family court one time and <laughs> we were in front of the judge and his suspender popped. <laughs> and apparently it was really tight because it really popped. <laughs> and it came out of his suit coat and everything. Made a loud noise. Um, but he had he had a lot of funny things. He was a nice person too. He, he was kind of, I remember him uh, representing a person who was accused of speeding in Westfield across the bridge. And his defense was that you couldn't get going across the bridge more than 30 miles an hour. So his client couldn't be guilty of speeding. And I said, because I live there, <laughs> I said, well, I don't think that's true. <laughs> that's, that's not exactly a good defense, Charlie. <laughs> but he, he would do things like that. He would give preposterous d defenses. But, you know, you would just be on the other side and start to giggle, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> so, yeah, he was, he was something special. And he just loved his son, um, Harley. Mm -hmm. Very much. So we always, in the, we're sitting in the family court a lot, you know. Um, oh, I remember another one too. Um, we would have to stand in the hall because there was no way for the lawyers to be anywhere other than standing in the hall holding up the walls. And it smelled bad because the people there didn't smell very good. And he would go into, was it Sheila's office? And, and get the, um, she had this stuff, this, this smell stuff <laughs> in her desk and he would go out and he would walk and drip this stuff down the hall in front of everybody. <laughs> it was, yeah, he was, he was a character too. Really liked him. When I think of Charlie Loveland, I also think of Bruce Carpenter. I didn't know him very well, no. I didn't know him. I knew Michael Sullivan. Okay. Who was another nice, nice guy? Mm -hmm. um, probably now, now judge. Oh, is he really? Yeah, of family court judge. Family court judge, because I knew he's never going to go anywhere because he couldn't be mean to anybody yeah. ever, <laughs> no matter what. 
Um, and, you know, people say, how would you ever be a lawyer? And it's like, I can't be mean for my own self, but I can be mean for somebody else. You know, I can stand up for somebody else. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. And then there was Marty. Mm -hmm. Marty's a pretty much of a character. Mm -hmm. Big guy. Big laugh. Big laugh. Nice. A lot, lot of puns. Nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Michael. I don't know where Michael is. Fully. Michael's in New York City. Yeah. He's out of practice of law, but he's doing uh, selling uh, artwork, specifically uh, antique maps. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, well. That surprises me. Because he was another nice guy. Um, whenever I would have a case that involved something litigate, litig litigious. litigation, litigious, litigatory, <laughs> I don't know which of those are words, he would help. Yeah. And that was, that was another wonderful thing about Phillips Lytle is there was always somebody that knew how to do whatever you needed, which was nice. Because uh, how things come up, I I had a case where I was representing an estate, and the man who had the deceased had owned a junkyard, and uh, he was fairly wealthy. He was a character too, but he was fairly wealthy. He died at his girlfriend's house, mm -hmm. which was a little bit hard on the family, and. Uh, he had like a hundred thousand discarded towers, tires in the back of this junkyard and uh, we had to deal with that in the estate because that was a big liability. Yeah. And there's where I was talking to Carolyn Burke. Mm -hmm. and that was just before I came to work at Phillips Lytle. Um, talking to her about, you know, what we should do. Should we have them wife disclaim? You know what should we do, and so that was another. That was just an example of the kinds of things that come up that you haven't dealt with before, and it's nice to have the depth to um, to go to. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, it's just if if some young a lawyer is listening to this video here, and Nancy Young, who's seen it all, been there, done that, and they're thinking about you know, kind of getting into the practice, starting their own practice. Would you give them any advice? What, what, would, what might you tell them? Hmm. I think that I would tell them to concentrate in one area. I, you can't to begin with because if you're going to go on your own, you can't because you won't have anything to do. Um, but it is... Um, comfortable, more comfortable later on, um, to be able to concentrate on one area, to concentrate your continuing education in one area, to um, have resources in one area. Um, it's also, I would say, nice to be allied, be part of a bigger organization, because you do have the depth to go to when there's something that you don't know, because nobody can know it all, you know? You can't. I, that's why I kind of admired Stephen, is that he would research it all. Mm -hmm. But then, he didn't make any money, mm -hmm. because he was always spending his time figuring things out. Right. So, I guess those would be the things. Always stay true to yourself, don't let anybody influence you to do anything that you don't want to do because that happens um, especially when you want to have a case and you know that it's a good one but they want you to do something that like with the tires to just pretend they don't exist yeah. that kind of thing but those are the things I would say um, yeah this has been great. You know, Clark, uh, one thing I didn't dare ask her on camera was, what did she oh, think about off, Greg off, Peterson? We're off tape now. Oh, I liked Greg Peterson. I admire Greg Peterson. Is it on? <laughs> you want it on? Yeah, I want okay, it on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Are. I admire Greg Peterson. Um, the things that he has done 
and the things that he has done for Jamestown just astonish me that I remember in one weekend I think he obtained a million dollars to buy the building for the Jackson Center and he's just got that kind of a personality that if he came to you and said would you give me some money it's oh yeah I give you some money <laughs> I give you my dog <laughs> whatever you want um, it's really nice really nice no, a good asset always spoke very highly of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in contrast to some of her colleagues <laughs> yeah yeah what to, I do remember one more funny story sure. I had did have a guy that come in, came in and was wanting to write a will and wanting to appoint himself as the executor. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's I, magic, man. Yeah. That is magic, if you can pull that off. Uh, I, had a, I really had a hard time <laughs> explaining to him why he couldn't be the executor. But that was funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good thing to end on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nancy. This has been great. Oh. It's, it's really a good thing.